So welcome to the next in this series of New Wine webinars. We're delighted to have um, Emma Einstein with us, who's Bishop of Penrith and a great friend of New Wine. Um, also a great friend of lots of you online uh, on this, uh, on this uh, webinar today. You may have passed through Trinity Bristol when she was principal there. And um, it's just great to have you there. This is one of a number of webinars that New Wine are doing. Um, in two weeks time, we're actually having a really important webinar conversation on the issues of race and diversity with Ben Lindsay, uh, but at the same time as this one. Um, so you'll be getting information through the leadership network about that. And I, I would love you to put that in your diary and that we can continue learning and growing together as we face what is probably one of the major challenges of our time. But we're facing another personal challenge at the moment, which is looking at a ministry that we're trying to undertake, which is not the ministry that we were trained for, and a context that none of us could ever really have predicted. And um, I think quite possibly during this time, most of us feel that we're out of our depth, um, that we're not sure what we're doing. And so we're really delighted that Emma is able to share with us today. Um, she has also um, written a book called Ambition, which I like so much that I put it in front of mine and um, wanted to just commend that book to you as a really helpful conversation um, and teaching around the areas of, of success and counting and comparison and all those sorts of issues that we're going to be unpacking today. So I'm going to pray for Emma in a moment before uh, she begins to speak to us and I thought I'd just read from Philippians chapter 2. Um, we, we are in this time being called back to a closer walk with the Lord. I think that's part of what this season is affording us the opportunity for. And this is what it means in terms of our own character and our own self-identity. So Paul writes, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, I think, we, we face two challenges, don't we? One is thinking too much of ourselves and the other is being too hard on ourselves. And um, one of the wonderful things about the, the, the life that Jesus modeled for us as leaders uh, in his footsteps is that he had nothing to lose, nothing to hide and nothing to prove. Um, that he was secure, um, that he never indulged in comparison and he never felt insecure. So Remember that Jesus is the model of our calling. Uh, so, Father, we thank you for Bishop Emma being with us today. We thank you for her wisdom in this area. We pray, Lord, that as she shares, that you would build us up, that any burdens that we're carrying would fall away, that any illusions under which we labor would be exposed, that your truth would be seated in our hearts, and we pray, Lord, that we would be built up to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus for ourselves and one for another. And we just ask that in his mighty name. We pray that the Spirit of God would minister to us as we share together today. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for... I was going to say coming to be with me in this seminar. I'm not sure whether you've come anywhere, you're in your studies and uh, we're all at home, but it's wonderful to be able to share with you. And I love that phrase that Paul, you just used in your introduction there, which um, none of us really knows what we're doing. And I think that is, that includes me. You know, we, we were, we were trogging along, we were doing ministry, we were doing stuff. Uh, I'd written a book, uh, which Paul has usefully, helpfully waved at us. And, uh, you know, it was kind of like we, we'd got it down. Uh, we knew what we were doing, we knew where we were headed. And 
the situation we we're finding ourselves in now has kind of come in and sideswiped everything that we knew we were doing and um, i wrote that book on ambition and success and counting and how we um how we compare ourselves with others and I've um, found that some of the themes that I wrote about there have kind of taken on a different meaning during these last few weeks and days. I still think that um, what does it look like to be successful? What does fruitfulness look like? Uh, how do we count things? What are the temptations to compare ourselves with each other? I still think all of those issues are there, but they've, they've kind of all been turned about 180 degrees. You know, they kind of all take on a slightly different sense and a slightly different meaning. So. I'm really pleased to be able to come and reflect on some of that with you. And what's going to, I'll, I'll talk for a little bit. I'll sort of, and literally this is going to be throwing out some ideas that I've been thinking about over the last few weeks. So I hope you don't mind if you're kind of guinea pigs in this and giving me the chance just to think through some stuff. Um, and then we'll go into breakout groups and then we'll have a, a sort of Q and A time so that we can reflect on some of this together. So I would just love to know how some of this stuff is landing with you in your context. So I'm just going to pause for a moment because I want to share a screen with you and I really hope this works. So give me a second or two, chance to stretch your legs if you want to. Uh, hang on, here we go. And we'll do that and we'll do that. And hopefully you should see a screen. Thumbs up if you can uh, see that all right. Yeah, brilliant. So what on earth does success look like for church leaders now? And I deliberately, every time I wrote success in my book, I put uh, inverted commas around it. And every time I say it when I speak, I kind of feel like I need to do this, you know, because success is not really a very Christian word, is it? It's not a word we use in ministry very much. We tend to talk about fruitfulness or faithfulness, and probably rightly so. You know, those are probably better words for us to use. But I deliberately wanted to use the word success and ambition. And it always feels like I'm swearing when I say either of those words in, in a Christian ministry context, because I want us to examine our motivation. I want us to think about what is it we think we're about? What, what are we doing? And especially now, um, as we're in the COVID pandemic, as we're coming out of that, what does it look like for us to be successful? as a church? What does that look like now? What does it look like to be a Christian leader who is doing the stuff that God wants them to do? What has this time done to our ambitions? You know, has it destroyed them? Has it reformulated them? Has it made us look at things slightly differently? And my guess is that you're probably here today because you want to redeem the time. Ephesians 5, 16 says, um, make the most of the time or redeem the time because the days are evil it says i don't think the days that we're living through are evil but they're certainly challenging how do we redeem this time what do we do with this period and it's this is a really tough one to talk about because i never want to suggest that god sent the pandemic or that it is in any way good you know i have friends whose relatives have, have died because of covid we can never ever say that this is a good time. It's been a deeply painful time for many different reasons. But given that, what might God want to bring out of it that is good? You know, God is in the business of redeeming things, of bringing good out of difficult times. What does he want to do in us and in the church that might redeem this time in that way that it says in Ephesians? And I want to just give you seven tools, and, and please don't panic because they'll be about two minutes each. They'll be very quick, each one, but seven thoughts or seven ways of thinking that I'd love to know what you think about. First, I want us to think a little bit about success and failure. Somebody asked Thomas Ed Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, whether he regretted all of his failed tests. And he replied, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. And I quite like that. Success and failure are very close um, in the Christian world. Uh, a little while ago, I set out to make a little video. We've all been online with our worship uh, over the last few weeks and months. And 
the things that people have seen on their screens have been the end products usually or the bits that we don't mind them seeing and I had the thought uh, what are the bits that might have landed on the cutting room floor you know what are the bits where we've tried and we failed and we've got up and we've tried again and I, I made a little video that I'm going to show you now with just some of the bloopers I kind of emailed around my friends and said send me the bits that didn't work you know the bit where the dog walked across or the bit where you got your, your words wrong and I put together a little video and I'll show it to you now um, but I was amazed that this video went viral I mean kind of sort of viral in a sort of minor Christian world sort of a way but it had about 30,000 views and I think that was because people realized that um, failure is part of what we we do you know failure is not something that is for some and not for others so here's a little video some of you I think on this webinar are even in it so you'll recognize yourselves good morning and Make me laugh. The Lord has gone up with a shout. <laughs> <laughs> testing, testing. On that day, that many would come to know your healing, your transformative, and your powerful work at. Crows in the background. Edit this bit off. For the Lord your God is with you. I've got it wrong again. It is. God is love. And so it kind of shows God's character when we do this. Um, I might have a little visitor with me also. Judah, you yeah. go see Daddy, please. Okay, I'm just talking on here. You go and see Daddy. Sorry, everyone, I've got a little visitor. <laughs> so we are coming to the end of our service on this uh, Easter day. But children, how have you been doing on your scavenging hunt? Um, oh, look, we've got an additional member of the family who's come to join us. Um, what, uh, what, what, is, what is on your tray, I wonder? Every Wednesday, uh, for the next few weeks, we are planning something uh, that you can... <laughs> As we record this service, Sonia will be speaking out the responses, many of which may be familiar with to you. <laughs> So let us pray. Just in a moment of silence, quiet your hearts and recognize our own shortcomings and failures. No, obviously not. Stronger than strong, you're mighty and they mighty, and louder than this song. Your love for me. Thank you very much, that was going quite well. Stop. Oh, that's the wrong way round. <laughs> uh, 
And so that is just my little thank you to all of you who've tried and failed and tried again at online worship over th the last few weeks and months. Um, I know the, the thought that you're really thinking about is, is anybody really still singing Be Bold, Be Strong? And yes, the answer is yes, they quite obviously are. So there we are. So let's think of some, some trends that we might want to, or some questions that we might want to ask ourselves as we think about what success looks like. And this is the... Um, is not uh, not working so well now. Hang on. There we go. There we go. I was in a meeting the other day uh, with a large group of people. In fact, I think it was all of the bishops of the Church of England. It's a horrible thing. Can you imagine all the bishops of the Church of England on Zoom, over a hundred of them? And uh, I heard somebody say this phrase, they were trying to make a contribution. And because of all the different screens, they said, I couldn't find where I was to unmute myself. Um, and they literally couldn't find their picture to, to press unmute on their picture. But I thought this was a really, a kind of prophetic statement really. I couldn't find where I was to unmute myself. And I wonder if there's a sense at the moment in which we think we don't even know who we are, never mind what we're meant to say into the situation. Perhaps you might be feeling overwhelmed by everything that has come across your experience over the last few weeks and months. We've all probably all been to quite a few webinars, quite a few sessions. We've read stuff online, you know, six things we need to know out of the pandemic, 10 things we need to do next, 11 things that the church will need in the future. And there can, if you're like me, there can be a sense in which you just feel a bit overwhelmed. You don't even know where I am in order to be able to unmute myself. So I think this first thing is just an encouragement really to, to stay mute, if you like, for as long as you need to. Don't feel that you have to be successful quickly in what you say. I wonder if this is a time where we need to reflect deeply on some of the things that God is showing us. And it would be very easy just to speak very quickly about what we've learned. And I wonder if we just need to take that time and to reflect and to contemplate. And just to think, really, whose kingdom am I part of? There's a whole load of stuff that is going on at the moment. There are a whole load of different um, strategies and a chance to look at this and you might have taken the opportunity in your, your church to think well we'll use this time to develop a new vision and a new strategy um, there's going to be all sorts of financial discussions going on what impact does this pandemic have and i think we just need time to to go deep you know maybe spend some time doing that reading that you've not done spend some time thinking deep thoughts before we unmute ourselves, don't feel the rush, I think, um, to unmute ourselves too quickly. Remember who we're rooted and we're grounded in. That's the, the first thing to say. Second thing I wanted to just ask is, does my church look big in this? One of the things that I spoke about in my book was the um, tendency to compare ourselves with each other, especially when it comes to counting. So, you know, we've got, my church has got this many members, my church has got that many members, is my church bigger than your church? How many people are coming on my Alpha course? And as leaders sometimes to get very tied up in those numbers and quite concerned um, about how we count things and if our graphs are going in the wrong direction. And I think this has taken on a new kind of feeling and a new um, focus during the pandemic because now we can literally count the number of people that engage with our online services. And we're literally going to have to do a lot of counting as our churches open up again to know how many people are even in our building. I've just been talking to my husband, who's a vicar, who's just come back to, um, from measuring his church and has said that he can get 15 people. He can get 15 people at a two metre distance safely in his church when it opens up. So we, there's going to be a lot of stuff around numbers. And it would be very tempting to take all that insecurity about whose thing is the biggest online or into the new era. And I suppose this is just an encouragement to us not to do that. You know, don't get caught up in a new kind of obsession with numbers. There's going to be a need to do quite a lot of counting of stuff in the next few weeks and months and years, particularly as we look at resources and how we're going to use them well. But don't allow your own, self of, own sense of self-worth to get caught up in those numbers. 
um, don't get drawn into a new kind of comparison as we come into the new normal. Don't get worried about whether my thing is more successful than your thing or vice versa. And that takes us to the next thing. They do not show good sense. I'd just like to read to you a bit from 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Paul says this, we don't dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they do not show good sense. What is it that you might be tempted to compare yourself with in this new era that we're coming into? As we come out of lockdown, what are the tendencies that you know that you might have in yourself to be jealous of or to compare yourself with something else? Paul goes on to say this, we, however, will not boast beyond our limits, but will keep within the field that God has assigned to us. And I've been really reflecting on that. I wonder if that's a word to us at the moment. Um, it's, it seems a very valid word. I'm, I live in Cumbria where there are lots of fields, but I don't think it means just a physical green thing with sheep in. You know, what is the, the area that God has assigned to you? What is the ministry that God has assigned to you? What's the church that God has assigned to you? What's the community? What is your field? And keep how do we keep satisfied within that without wanting to compare ourselves with somebody else's field? So that's a, a thing that you might think about. Number four, in your anger, do not sin. This is a time where some really deep and important themes have emerged for us as a church. I'm really pleased to, to hear that you have the session uh, with Ben Lindsay um, next week because I think because we've been in lockdown and because of the pressures that we found ourselves in and maybe the time that we've had to think uh, about fundamental things, we know that we need to change. We know that there are things that need to change in our churches, in our culture, in our society, in our communities. This is a quote by St. Augustine. Hope has two beautiful, beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are and i like that quote but i want to ask questions about what that anger looks like and i just want to say to you there may be something that is really burning in you at the moment that god has awakened in you that is kind of verging on anger actually at the way things are it may be to do with black lives matter it may be an issue of injustice in your community how do we make sure that as we come out of lockdown and as we come into the new world that God is calling us to, we keep that passion, but we don't sin in our anger. In your anger, do not sin. Sometimes I think the pandemic, the lockdown started off with a period of kind of we're all in this together and we're going to pull together and we're going to clap for carers and it's all about community and it's all about being together. Sometimes I feel like the tone of public debate has changed a bit over the last few weeks. And actually there's, you can see it on Twitter and social media that there's become a bit more bitterness and a bit more, um, you know, point scoring and blaming. And I suppose to, to all of us, the challenge is how do we stay on the right side of that passion, that anger that God might be placing on our hearts? So whatever it is that is firing you at the moment, just spend some time with that and feel all the feels, as they say, you know, really think, well, God, what do you want me to do about this? But how are we going to do it in a way that stays in line with God's will and with some of the qualities and values that he would have us um, show as Christians and as Christian leaders. So that's another thought you might want to do some reflecting on that. Point five, um, what about the goats? There is a farm um, in Lancashire and it is called Cronkshaw Fold Farm and Cronkshaw Fold Farm is a goat farm and Cronkshaw Fold Farm made its money before the pandemic by having goats by selling goats products and by allowing people to come and visit the goats. And obviously when coronavirus hit, all of that shut down and Cronkshaw Fold Farm couldn't make money in the way that it did previously. 
And so one day they sat down and they must have had a meeting that went something like this. Okay, what have we got? And they said, we've got goats. And then somebody said, so where is everybody at the moment? And somebody, some bright spark in the meeting will have said, well, everybody's on Zoom. And somebody must have said, how do we put together the goats with Zoom? And Goats on Zoom was born. And they invested in a whole load of webcams that they put in the goat pens. And you can pay five pounds to have one of their goats turn up at your Zoom meeting. And it's brilliant. If you've not done it, I encourage you to try it. So we had a family quiz the other night uh, with my parents and our kids who are around the place. And um, this goat, Brett the goat, you can even pick the goat according to its characteristics. It's fab. So Brett the goat came to our quiz. Um, I'm really trying to summer up, summon up the courage to have one of them to come to our bishop's leadership meeting. But I haven't quite done that yet. But, but the point about this is they, they looked at what they had to offer they looked at what was the need and they put the two things together. So I wonder if success for us at the moment might be simply about asking, what have we got? You know, what is my church good at? What is my church known for? And what context do we see around us? And how might we creatively put those two things together? What about the goats? There's a definition of vocation, isn't there? It's where your mission is where your passion meets the world's deepest needs. So what does that look like for you now? What are your goats and how are you going to take them online? Uh, would be a question I would give you. And number six, uh, slightly weird as well. Keep looking at the tadpoles. So right at the start of lockdown, obviously, like all of you, I've been at home in my home for the last uh, three and a bit months. And I started right at the start of lockdown, watching the tadpoles in my pond in my garden. And actually, I think I've got Oh, yeah, here they are. There's that's picture. And that's disgusting, isn't it? That's lots and lots of tadpoles. But anyway, I filmed them. So these are in my garden. This was a few weeks ago. And I've looked at those. I've had the time to look at my tadpoles every single day during the lockdown. And I've seen them grow and I've seen them grow legs and I've seen some of them become frogs and hop away. And I want to keep in my life the space to keep looking at the tadpoles. What is it that you've been able to do during this time of lockdown? that has given you space, has given you life. Maybe you found a new hobby, maybe you've done gardening, uh, maybe you've started to phone somebody that you didn't before. What is there in the pace of life that's been better for you that you want to keep into the future? And I think we would transform the way we do ministry if we allowed some of those things that have blessed our lives. There have been things that have been really hard as well, but there have been some opportunities in what we've um, been through over the last two weeks, few weeks and months. What is some of the pace of life stuff that you want to take into the future with you? And then finally, before we have a chance to chat about some of this together, be a dealer in hope. I think it was Napoleon who said a leader is a dealer in hope. My husband Matt is really good to go on holiday with and for lots of different reasons but one of the reasons is whenever we go somewhere where the weather is awful and that's usually most holidays we go on I don't know we just seem to have a, a knack wherever we go the weather will be awful like even if it's the hottest place in the world he will constantly say as it's teeming with rain and there's clouds and there's grey he will look to the horizon and he will say it's brightening up over there and that's just become a bit of a family phrase for us. You know, it can be snow and rain and hail, but we will say it's brightening up over there. And it never does brighten up in there, but that's over there. But that sort of phrase brings um, a sense of hope, a sense of possibility, a sense that the sun might come out. And I wonder if in this era, we need to be leaders who are constantly saying it's brightening up over there. There is hope. There is a better time to come. We, you will be involved in a lot of meetings at the moment that try and predict the future. And I just want to say be wary of those because none of us knows what the future is going to look like. I think it's better than not thinking at all about the future or worse still just trying to be like the past. But I really like this. This is a quote from C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Letters. And he says, we need to think not about the future, but about eternity. 
So this is what he says, the humans live in time, but God destines them to eternity. He therefore wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. The future is, of all things, the least like eternity. And C.S. Lewis says that the problem is that the future, when we try and think about the future, we can feel anxious because we don't know what it will be like. And how much is that true now? However, as Christians, we can focus on, a, on an eternity that we know what it will be like because it will be when Jesus returns and his kingdom is established throughout all the earth. When every tear is dried, there is no more suffering. So how can we be people who live in the light of that eternity, who constantly say it's brightening up over there. I've been using this quote quite a bit in meetings recently. We're doing quite a lot of work as a diocese here at thinking about vision and strategy. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. How are, as leaders are we people who show people what the sea is like. We will have to do some work building ships and getting wood and dividing up the tasks because that's something we all need to do. But how do we keep folk, people focus on the end goal, which is eternity? So you're gonna go into some breakout groups now and just spend some time thinking about how any of this might apply to you and apply to your context or any thoughts that you've got on the basis of it. But if you'd like a little framework for doing that, you might want to use this. Mark Jesus said in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. You could spend some time thinking, well, what does this time say to me? What is, it spe what is special about this time? How have I seen the kingdom of God come near? What do I need to repent of or turn away from or change? as we come out of lockdown? And what is the good news for me and my context at the moment? So that's just a very simple little structure. If it's helpful, use it. If it's not, um, just take the conversation whichever way is best for you. And we'll gather back together and I'd love to know your thoughts on some of that in a little while. Great, well, welcome back everyone. Um, we just to say we're going to be continuing for another 15 to 20 minutes and have a little uh, opportunity to pray as well. Um, we'd love to hear questions or comments, um, but rather than the complete free for all, if you want to put things into the chat bar so we can see that, that'll help me to, to call on you. And um, one of the, as you're thinking that or typing that, um, one of the reflections I wanted to start with, with, with Emma, was just that... Um, there's a lot of um, digital comparison going on at the moment. And um, just, you know, probably all of us have been in meetings where somebody is absolutely thriving during this time and their church has got 10 times the normal number of people that live in their city attending their Zoom meeting. Um, and it's quite discouraging, isn't it? And the truth is a lot of us really feel out of our depth. Um, so Emma, do you maybe to offer some reflection on um, the comfort that a lot of us experience from coming somewhere here and then we we can share what it's really like uh, i think it was another c.s lewis quote actually that which is that friendship begins when one person says to the other really you too i thought i was the only one and it's a brilliant quote so it, what would you say about taking the masks off during this time mm. i think it's a really good question i mean in some ways I, i'm i'm with those who say hasn't it been great in terms of the opportunities? You know, it, there have been some amazing opportunities to engage more widely by putting things online. Um, and I, I really hope we can make the most of those opportunities and not, when we go back to whatever normal might look like, not let go of some of those contacts that we've made. So, you know, I think there is a lot of really good stuff out there. Um, but, but it's hard, isn't it, when you're just, I don't know about you, but, I, you know, I've barely left my study for the last 14 weeks. Mm. And it can be very easy to lose a sense of perspective 
when you're not there is something about being with people face to face and it's often in the the places around the edges you know it's not i have to say i've not massively missed most of the meetings i go to but i've missed the coffee beforehand or the little chat that you have in the corridor and having all of that removed i think leaves us with a real sense of what well who you know who even are we anymore and um it makes it very difficult to compare to, to kind of know where we are and we can we see people doing amazing stuff on their screen i mean i go to about six church services every sunday at the moment all around the world which is amazing and i'm loving it it's such a good opportunity I came to your church the other day paul it's such a good opportunity to sort of see what's um or you know to see what's going on but it can be very easy to think well that's really good and my thing isn't like that or um, why didn't I think of that? And, and not to have some of the balancing things, which are the human contact that we need just to keep a, a sense of perspective. So that's why this is really helpful. I think just opportunities to, to meet with others, even if it is somebody described it to me the other day is uh, we now meet through a screen darkly, but one day we will see face to face. Um, and I quite like that. There is a sense of sort of waiting for that time that we can see each other face to face, but we can still get glimpses of that now. Yeah, actually, D Dave in the in the chat has put about um, unmute yourself, Dave, because I may not say it as well as you, but just that that tendency we have to compare ourselves with others, look at their viewing figures, and because we think that bigger numbers are better, we we adapt to try and be like that. So, have I captured the heart of that question, Dave? Yeah, totally. We, we found other local churches are doing this and that, and they've got more numbers. So, what can we do that they're doing that will then make us more attractive or up our numbers? And, extrapolating from their numbers that, that it's better or that they're doing something that's kind of the magic trick that's working mm. and losing the, sight of who we are in that as well and the tension in that is is one of our, our motives isn't it because we want to be learning and if somebody does something else that's good you want to steal from it and, and learn from it um how, how do we check that in our spirit what would you say emma well i think firstly be wary of the numbers because, you know, just as before the lockdown, it's a thing, isn't it? All clergy, when you say how many were at your thing, they kind of add 10% and round it up just to make it sound a bit better. So there's probably an online version of that. And, you know, the, the numbers, I think, online are especially deceptive because apparently it counts. If somebody's just flicked on your Facebook for like 30 seconds and then gone off somewhere else, they're still mm. listed as a view. So you can't really trust the numbers. But... I, I think it is, as Paul said, it's about learning what, you know, it's absolutely fine. I, I've loved the sort of shop window into other people's churches at the moment, because you can say, goodness, I never, you know, I wouldn't have been able to go to that church, wouldn't have had the time, uh, but I've been able to see what they do there, and I can learn that, and I can admi admire it and learn from it. Um, but I, I guess it's back to the goats, isn't it? It's like, you know, well, what, what is my goat? Or what is it that this goats thing is going to take over? Um, what is it that we do? that that ch that huge church down the road can't do you know if you're in a small church you can literally phone all your members or if you're in a larger church you can do other things or you know i think it's about not not thinking that any other person's thing is better by nature of it being somebody else's thing it's about well who is you know what's my field who has god called me to be yeah and be wary of the numbers because it could be the bishop of penrith attending six services on a sunday morning that yeah. could be the reason for this great online growth. For any of it. <laughs> um, Suzanne, um, why don't you ask your, your observation, really, Suzanne Williams, just observing yeah. about maybe there is a bit of a shift, actually, in the last few days. It was, it was Claire, actually, who, who said it, um, Weston, that uh, even, in, you know, whereas initially we were all in this together, um, whether we were the ones that had received letters to say you're shielded or whether we were the ones who were choosing to be more cautious or having to go out as key workers, we were all supporting one another. And even just in the last um, you know, week or so, there's been that shift and just that sense of really needing to still support those who are still shielding till August, September, those uh, you know, who are dealing with increased levels of anxiety, um, you know all sorts of things to sort of manage and i guess different expectations um, yeah uh, uh, and i think it is 
it's kind of permission to, to be where we are, isn't it? And to not feel we have to rush on or, or feel like somebody else or be in somebody else's experience. We will all have experienced this differently. Um, and I think one of the one of the great things about the lockdown has been social media. You know, I've, honestly, it's kept me in touch with the world and I've loved it. But one of the awful things about the lockdown has been social media because um, there can be that tendency to think, well, you know, all of these people are feeling that, therefore I should feel that as well. Um, and, and we don't always speak to each other in the most kind way in social media. So, and, and I do think that the psychological pressure of lockdown is is taking its toll and maybe we are losing patience a bit and we are losing a bit of community spirit so I, I think it's a question of well how do we how do we keep moving in the fruits of the spirit you know how do we keep exhibiting love joy peace patience all of those things with each other and not allow um you know not not allow some sort of more negative ways of interacting with each other to creep in and would you would you say as well that um that the people's experience is has been more similar, which in some ways actually I, I know I'm involved in a seminar for premier uh, for premier on Thursday, which is about digital inclusion, and one of the great breakthroughs is is that actually we've all had the experience that many people have all the time, um, and so we we we're understanding what it means to include people who physically can't attend. Now people's experience is going to start bifurcating and. And, and splitting up more and more um, people who can come back, people who could come back but aren't comfortable to come back yet, people who can't come back. There'll be all sorts of different things. Um, and I think there's something about bearing with one another and um, the strong and the weak um, without wanting to put labels too quickly on people. Um, how, do we, how can we hold together? It's a time I think when we need a lot of grace and understanding. Different people's decisions are going to be driven by different circumstances. Yeah, and I guess this is one of the times when we, we really need to keep our kind of comparisons contextualised and keep them in check. Because in a way, it was easy, wasn't it? Because when lockdown came in, that was all of us. You know, it was like, no question, no churches, nothing. We're all at home. And that was simpler. It, it's, it's getting more complicated now. You know, are you opening your church? How many do you have? What decisions are you taking? Um, and it can get very easy to to get judgmental in that. Um, but we are so different, aren't we? I mean, we are different people. We're different leaders. We have different contexts. One of the wonderful things about the church is it's not uniform across the country. There's rural, urban, larger, smaller, um, younger dynamic, older dynamic. And I just think we need to give each other a break and actually work extra hard at being supportive of each other. Um, rather than questioning, you know, and trusting each other to know what's best for our own communities. Yeah, it's interesting that you said work extra hard because um, that was what I was going to come on to next, which a couple of questions here about work. Now, when you say work extra hard, I know you mean prioritise. I mean, uh, I mean in, in demeanour and internal, internal way. Yeah. Uh, like a couple of interesting questions, though, about... Um, taking up the Antoine de saint exupéry uh, quote, how do we keep yearning it's for the so much sea? Than I would, Paul. Uh, not my first time. Um, how do we keep yearning for the sea when caught up with the busyness of building the ship? And then and, and Claire's version of that of, of, or development of that question is how do we keep our focus and energy on the things which ang anger us and step out with courage to do something when focus, folks around us are not sensing the same thing? All the short-term need for other things consume the time and energy. So I think mm. they're both questions really about um, as, as the busyness that we're in continues and as the extra demands of re-entry into buildings might come upon us, how do we actually stay with that focus? Um, the things that we've maybe heard the Lord say during this time, the, the, the deep sea yearnings of, of God himself, or the voice of the spirit and the challenges that we've been hearing about the problems in society. How can we, how can we kind of move forward without getting overwhelmed by a return to busyness? The, the phrase that has been in my head all the way through this is that sense of redeeming the time. You know, God, God gives us time 
and then we have to decide what we what we do with it and i don't know about you but for me this lockdown has been busier than ever i mean it's it's all been at my computer but it it's like everybody suddenly decided to re renew every vision and strategy they ever had and um it, it's all come at once so it's been really busy um and i guess there is something about having the courage to say um I'm not going to get caught up in that tide of looking for wood and making plans for ships. You know, I, I'm going to give that its rightful space because I know we need to do that. And it's a really good opportunity to do that. We're doing that as a diocese, you know, looking at what we need to invest in going forward. But it's about saying if you've discovered something of a, a, a new yearning for the sea, if you like, in, in respect of a new issue, whether that's um, racial justice or just something in your community, don't let that be shortchanged and take the time you need for that and the time you know activism might actually involve reading the time you might need to spend might be going deep rather than running about so if you are sensing a passion for something don't automatically think what can i do doing is important but also think what can i pray and what can i read and where can i go down deep as well as rushing out to do things um, because then our actions will have more rootedness and more groundedness. Um, so don't ever apologise for praying <laughs> and reading and taking time to do that. Yeah, thank you. I, I think a, a last question, actually, I'm going to call on um, Rob Bewley. Rob's put some comments in the chat. Um, really, really about how do we, I think, going forward with with confidence but actually managing expectations that there we we need to define a reality which still has roadblocks ahead um so there, there's a tentative how do you go forward tentatively and confidently at the same time rob do you want to express that in in, in a better way well i think it was about um in a sense you said it emma about the hope that we profess might not be the same hope that people we're talking to their hope might be to get back into the building and have it as it was before um, we might be hoping for something a lot greater, but it's actually how we're people of hope. Well, actually, um, you know, I have great concerns about where this pandemic's going because I'm quite angry about something to do with public policy. Mm. Um, and so it's actually matching up that facing the reality of it's not all going to be over in a couple of weeks' time um, and speaking truthfully into that while at the same time being people of hope that, that transcends that, if that makes sense. Okay. It, it's a really good question. I, I don't think hope means um, brushing over things. I don't think hope, holding hope means saying it's all going to be okay, just get over it, we just need to be happy now. That's, that's, all, that's very different from the kind of hope that we profess, mm -hmm. which is that even in the midst of, I mean if you think, you know, the kind of vision for the New Jerusalem um, in Revelation was written to a church that was experiencing suffering and persecution. So that there, there is, that's why I really like the kind of it's brightening up over there thing, because even when it's raining um, and you know you need to put an umbrella, there's always the hope that the sun is gonna come out. So it's, I mean, you know, you know this stuff, this is, it's theology, it's the kind of now and not yet, it's living in the pain of the tension and the current reality whilst one day believing that God will come and make it all new. And what can we do to draw that future reality into the present? You know, I don't think it's just, well, one day it'll be okay. It's kind of, what can we do? At, at Trinity, our motto, um, anybody at Trinity will be bored of me saying this, but was live like the kingdom is near. You know, the kingdom is not just something that's coming one day. It's something that we can draw more deliberately into the present by the way we are. So I don't, I don't know if that answers the question, but there, there is a real tension in that. Emma, thank you. Um, I, I don't, I'm sure everybody would echo our thanks today. Uh, I always feel incredibly encouraged when I um, hear Emma talk. You've got a wonderful way of pointing us back to the essentials and connecting us again to Jesus, which is just life-giving for us. So thank you so much for that. I see a few clap icons popping up. Um, oh, thank you, it's been lovely to we, um, before we go, just to spend a couple of minutes and um, let's allow the Lord to minister to us. Um, so I just encourage you to, to take a moment where you are and just be conscious of God's presence with us.
thank you for all that we've heard. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would take from those words and that you would minister to each of us personally, the ones which are most charged, most apt, most life-giving for us today. And um, as Emma was speaking, I, I looked up the passage that she returned to from Ephesians 5. And uh, as, as I read it, I ask that the Spirit of God would, would minister these words to you. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And Spirit, we pray that wisdom would be given to us where we lack it. Making the most of every opportunity and help us to see the new things that are possible. Possible even as we are now and that might open up for us next. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And so we pray, Lord, that you would turn down the volume on all the noise and the opinions and the perspectives around us, and that you would increase the volume on the voice of your spirit. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And so, Lord, we, we want to refuse other comforts and other escapes and come again to you as the answer to the needs that we carry. Lord, you are our first resort, not our last resort. You alone are the one who saves. And rather than getting drunk on wine, let us be filled with the Spirit. And speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Singing and making music from our hearts to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so may we speak life to each other and may we speak worship to you, Lord God. And uh, we pray that our worship would be something that we can share and that a day will soon come when we can stand in the same place and worship you together. And I just pray, Lord, for um, the strength and grace for every person who is on this seminar today, that you'd help them in all that comes next. Uh, thank you for the churches they represent. Thank you for their love for all the saints. And I pray that they would know your love for them in turn. And we just bless you for this time together and um, commit each other to your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.